Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Comic Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Oak, a host of the channel, and today I'll be talking to Dr. Neil Cohn about his book, Who Understands Comics, published by Bloomsbury in 2020. Dr. Cohn is currently an associate professor at the Tilburg Center for Cognition and Communication at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Neil Cohn is an American cognitive scientist best known for his pioneering research in the overlapping cognition between graphic communication and language. His books, The Visual Language of Comics 2013 and the 2021 Eisner nominated Who Understands Comics from 2020 establish a foundation for the scientific study of comics structure. Dr. Cohn also co-created several emoji, for example, the melting face, shaky face, breath face, different emoji uh, recently. The book Who Understands Comics uh, pays attention to drawing and sequential images, which are so pervasive in contemporary society that we may take their understanding for granted, Dr. Cohn asks. How transparent are they really and how universally are they understood? Combining recent advances from linguistics, cognitive science, and clinical psychology, his book argues that visual narratives involve much greater complexity and require a lot more decoding than widely thought. Although increasingly used beyond the sphere of entertainment as materials in humanitarian, educational, and experimental contexts, Dr. Cohn demonstrates that their universal comprehension cannot be assumed. Instead, understanding a visual language requires fluency that is contingent on exposure and practice with a graphic system, bringing together rich but scattered literature on how people comprehend and learn to comprehend a sequence of images. This book coalesces research from a diverse range of fields into broader interdisciplinary views of visual narrative to ask the question, who understands comics? The main takeaway is that the understanding of sequential images is more complex than what people give credit to, and it is not entirely transparent, but requires com- competency to understand and decode the images. In this interview, Dr. Cohn discusses some common misconceptions about comics, the ability to read and make comics, and how drawings are at the core of so many creations. All right, Dr. Neil Cohn, welcome to the show. Neil, I was wondering if you could begin the interview by telling us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks for having me. Um, sure, I am a uh, associate professor at Tilburg University in the Department of Cognition and Communication. Uh, I uh, have been, I guess I should say, a, a comic artist since I was a child um, and uh, worked for various comic companies and uh things as a teenager. And when I was uh, in college, I started an interest in, in linguistics and cognitive science and started studying the relationship of that to comics uh, and have then been doing it ever since. Um, and with that, I've been you know writing books and papers and doing lots of research about the structure and cognition of comics. Um, and I guess that's a, a, a brief intro to me. <laughs> And in this book, you're really trying to break down the assumption of universality, universality, there we go, which uh, you call the sequential image transparency assumption or CETA. So I don't know if you want to use that term here. And for those who may not be familiar with your work, I feel like this is one of the central themes. Uh, Could you quickly explain how sequential images or visual narratives are not transparent? Yeah, so I think that oftentimes it's worth first describing why we might think it's transparent in the first place. Uh, And that transparency, I think, comes because people oftentimes don't recognize the complexity and uh, proficiency needed to understand images in the first place. Uh, We generally think of images as being just the same thing as any other things that we see, like you see the world and then you see pictures. And because pictures look like things in the world, oftentimes uh, we think, oh, you, that comes for free. You need no learning to understand these things. Um, and so that notion is often extended across a sequence of images. So now a sequence of images is just, well, that's a, a progression of time or a progression of events. And we understand how time progresses. So of course we can understand how time progresses across a sequence of images. Now, 
images in sequence are not just a sequence of time. In fact, I would debate that they are not sequences of time at all. Um, but uh, then, in fact, sequence of images require quite a bit of proficiency as well to understand how they're understood. And the ways in which they uh, vary is, first, they can vary quite a lot in the ways in which the they convey meaning across an image sequence, the types of, say, patterns and things that are going on within an image sequence. Um, those patterns vary uh, based on uh, cross-cultural um, systematicity. So comics from Asia typically have a different sort of structuring of uh, sequences than comics from the United States. And studies show, for example, that readership of those types of comics modulates how people understand sequential images generally. Um, and that's actually a topic of my next book, but we can talk about that later, maybe. Um, the uh, They also, uh, there are people who just simply can't construe a sequence of images as a sequence. Um, a lot of these studies, so a, a, a lot of times researchers have used sequential images as an attempt at other types of tasks. Uh, so they to study, say, how people understand other people's thoughts, to study event structures, et cetera, they use a sequence of images. Um, people also use these in humanitarian efforts because they assume sequential images are transparent. So if you go to a, a rural area where uh, they haven't been that westernized, maybe they'll use understand a sequence of images to understand you know, farming and other tasks. Um, and when, in various papers, they have tried to do this in various rural areas and, and other uh, populations. Uh, they find that the people just didn't understand the sequence of images. Uh, so their assumption that this was going to be a universal method of communication was undermined. Uh, and they often, and sometimes researchers take these materials into the field, they use them, and then they don't report the results because they have a quote unquote failed task um, because their quote unquote task didn't work when really what it was was the people didn't have an understanding of sequential images in the first place. So I, I have various sources of both 40 years of academic sources about this that just scattered mentions of people not understanding a sequence of images and various researchers who've told me through personal communication that their tasks fail, that these sorts of things. Um, you also find it with, say, children. Uh, children don't understand a sequence of images like in a comic uh, until about age four. Um, uh, which of course undermines the idea that uh, kids are just immediately understanding things for free because there's a developmental trajectory to the, the acquisition of these things. And of course, if you never get exposed to a sequence of images and you never do that learning process, you end up like the people who then can't understand a sequence of images. Uh, and even you even see this in uh, proficiency by adults who are enculturated with, say, Western-style sequential images, uh, like in comics, uh, where uh, the uh, proficiency and familiarity and uh, frequency with which people, say, read comics uh, modulates how they under uh, their, their comprehension. So you see this in measures of uh, reaction times, to visual sequencing, to eye tracking, to uh, their brain waves when they read comics. All of these things are affected by the degree to which people have proficiency and expertise in understanding a sequence of images. And that expertise comes from reading comics or reading visual narratives of different types. Um, so you don't, it's it's very much not universal. There is an expertise associated to this and, and a learning trajectory. Uh, it's not free just because we understand how things look in the world and events. And when you say that uh, they're not for free, uh, do images teach how they are supposed to be read themselves in the sense that we pay for this competency through exposure to the medium? Or does it require some sort of formal um, introduction and guidance to understanding the image? That's a great question. And I love the way you phrased it. I don't think I've ever heard anybody take my comes for free and then say, well, what is paid for? Who pays for it then? Um, that's a, a fun phrasing. Um, yeah, I think that the the understanding comes through exposure and practice. And that exposure and practice are naturally acquired through um, well, when 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 
through developmental trajectory, by which I mean that when people are children and they're exposed, they just acquire it. They, their brains figure it out. Um, and there seems to be in general for, for both language and drawing and visual narrative comprehension, a critical learning period up until about puberty, apex is around puberty, um, where if you aren't exposed to these things, it becomes manifestly harder later in life to become completely proficient. That doesn't mean that you can't ever become proficient, but it becomes significantly harder, especially to get uh, certain nuances of the structure. Um, uh, so, you know, when, let's say, when you're growing up, so to speak, uh, to, to generalize, then it does come, the, the cost is low for acquiring it. Uh, when people are, are adults, and then they go back and they say, say had minimal exposure later in life, it does take more effort to then become proficient. Um, because you're, I mean, it, your brain is less plastic, you're, you're, you're less flexible, uh, and you're no longer, uh, your, your brain is no longer seeking to acquire these structures um, through exposure. Uh, so in that case, you may need more formal training, and uh, it, it becomes harder to become truly proficient to, let's call it, if you were just describing it in terms of language ability, it'd be like near native or native level of fluency, that would be significantly harder uh, later in life. So, uh, un and that's unlike writing. So writing and uh, literacy is something that must require formal training. Uh, you don't just understand writing by being exposed to writing systems enough. Uh, you have to be formally taught those correspondences and, and the shapes and what those things, you know, uh, link to. But drawing is not like that. You just naturally uh, acquire the structures across a developmental trajectory the same way as you do for language. So the, the comparison would be then, um, if people who are already fluent in a language think about how hard it is to learn a second language, that's what it'd be like to then learn how to draw and comprehend a sequence of images later in life. It's the same degree of, say, uh, proficiency uh, challenges, more or less. But in our culture, at least, most people are exposed at least a little bit to sequential images while they're growing up. And whether it's fully in comics or just like instruction manuals and things like that, which have their own conventions that are not necessarily um, the same as in comics or just reading instruction manuals doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to fully understand you know, manga or something like that. Very different structures that are involved. But uh, with that minimal exposure, at least gives you a little bit of a leg up to be able to then comprehend uh, more complex things than if you had zero exposure, I would imagine. Yeah, and on the subject of language, and I'll, I'll quote you back to yourself just to get this line from the book for the listening audience. Um, you wrote, comics themselves are not a visual language. It would be odd to say that novels are a written language. And this is equally odd of the misnomer that comics are a visual language. And this is such a key concept, which is so often taken for granted. And you use the term uh, visual language theory. And I wanted to ask, where do you see the applications of of this visual language theory outside of comic studies where this uh, awareness of VLT is really needed. I'm thinking about the really bad sequential art uh, on the evacuations instructions of a certain discount airline uh, that really obscure the process, for example. Sure. Um, yeah, so so it, it's nice that you highlight this, because this is, I think, something that is often misunderstood in my work. So even though, as you, you, you quoted me back there, what you what say not uh, part of that quote is where I say, in bold italics and underline, comics are not a visual language. And I have said that in every book that I do. And somehow people then cite that those books and say, comics are a visual language. So just completely missing the very explicit statement that I make about this. And it's difficult because uh, really what I'm trying to do is provide a category that doesn't exist in common discussion. So uh, the, the uh, common way that I break it down is I say, um, well, you speak in a spoken language and you draw in a blank. And 
if I say, what do you, if I ask people, what do you draw in? People look at me like that's the weirdest question I've ever heard. Um, but what do you draw in is directly equivalent to what do you speak in? And you speak in a spoken language, you draw in a visual language. Um, drawing itself is not a visual language. It, drawing, you use this system, right? Drawing is a process. The system, you use that system to create uh, uh, the graphic expressions. And similarly, you wouldn't, as you quoted, you wouldn't say that novels are a language because they are written in a language. Same thing with comics. Comics aren't a language. They're written in a language or drawn in a language. And that's, I think, the the like baseline understanding of my research. And I think, as you said, it's often misunderstood um, and misquoted and, and um, uh, not fully acquired because people think of comics as being a medium and that's a place that i actually disagree and i would say comics are not a medium they are a uh, a, a whole variety of social constructs uh, that come together whether it's a format uh, specific visual languages that are associated to them uh, a cu cultural context why are picture books and comics uh, not the same cultural category. Why uh, are you know instruction manuals and in comics not the same category, uh, even though they use similar building blocks? Well, there's a whole bunch of social reasons why. Um, same reason why a magazine and a novel are not the same, even though they might use the same spoken, you know, written language in them. So, uh, visual languages are the things that we produce as a system. And 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 once you separate out this notion of visual languages from comics, you can realize that there are visual languages all over the place. That basically, visual languages are the stuff that pictures are made of. So, all historical, cultural drawing systems and graphic systems are tied to different visual languages from different contexts. Uh, all you know the difference between instruction manuals and comics are oftentimes uh, the visual languages that they are drawn in are different types of visual languages, slightly different um, uh, uh, conventions. Um, you know, the, the, everything that is drawn has some origination in a visual language. So once you have that notion, it you no longer have to talk about the particular media. You can talk about the nature by which those media might be created. Um, and there you have, you know, what permeates across comics and memes and drawings and advertising and, you know, Japanese scrolls and Egyptian carvings and, you know, whatever sorts of things you want to talk about, because those are all different visual languages in the same way that we talk about there being lots of different spoken languages that all have various different contexts. So making that link ends up, you know, opening things up even more. And it, it really, I would say my research really isn't about comics, even though I access it through comics so much. My research is about visual languages um, uh, because those are not the same thing. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the, a long uh, uh, description of the differences between these things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and I, I'm really curious. So we handle your work a lot in comic studies. Are there any fields that you wish you could uh, launch uh, the visual language theory into that you think they would benefit from it? Or Well, I mean, most of my work is within uh, cognitive sciences and psychology and linguistics, where of course it's a bit more controversial to say that something is a language. Um, uh, and in a literal sense, I'm not making a metaphor. I'm, I'm very literal about this. Um, and so that's a, uh, uh, ongoing, uh, challenge endeavor that is basically what my career is uh, aiming to do. But of course, this extends all over the place. So um, you know, you can ask, what does a notion of a visual language do for, say, art history or for education, uh, et cetera? You know, education being the one that I'm kind of most often uh, concerned with, because let's say you know, there's, there's a a large movement now. Um, thankfully, I I was into it 20 years ago when I was in college, not to date myself, but um, of pushing for comics in education, quote unquote. Um, and I think it, that often does break down into two different sides. One side is comics in education and the other side is visual language in education. Um, and those are not the same thing. They are often conflated. So uh, whether you, let's say, have a 
book that happens to be drawn in sequential images and text, that'd be the use of visual language for educational purposes. Um, let's say it's a nonfiction textbook sort of thing. That's the use of visual language. We might call it a comic, but really you're using the visual language. Comics in education might be, you know, using mouse to teach about the Holocaust or using established comics that we consider as socio in the sociocultural context of being comics in educational contexts, whether that is to discuss yeah, as discussion points for other topics or for their literary qualities themselves. All of those things are perfectly valid. And that is comics and education, but visual language and education is not the exact same thing, but largely we think about them. But when, the, when people talk about comics and education, they conflate those two things together and they don't have to be the same. Uh, they are, they are actually separate notions and realizing that would be important. I think. Yeah, I think that's a, a definitely an important distinction. I'm glad you're making that here because uh, comics and education, which should be in some cases labeled sequential art or sequential narrative or narrative art or something like that in education are indeed uh, quite desperate uh, things in there. Um, so if I can also ask you something you already alluded to, um, in general, in your work, you don't necessarily present your work uh, with yourself at the center. You really focus on the data and argumentation, but you illustrate and uh, you make these visual <laughs> narratives as well. Um, you also uh, have a very heavily illustrated website for any listeners who are interested in seeing the website, both for presenting work and also presenting uh some of Neil's art. Um, and have you ever had to rethink a theoretical assumption in the literature because of your drawing experience or used your knowledge uh, that you have of creating images to inform your study design and theory? Uh, yeah. So I, I would say actually all of the basis of my theory comes from my intuitions as a fluent producer of visual language. Uh, so I think if you look say it the different let's just think about the theoretical domain if you look at within comic studies the arguments that are made that i make about the structure of comics and and visual languages versus a lot of other people i think there's a a substantive difference in their character because I'm coming kind of from the inside out where I'm able to draw from my own intuitions as somebody who's been doing this and producing this for my entire life uh, versus somebody uh, and at a professional level, I should say, uh, versus somebody who comes at it from the outside, who is not necessarily proficient or fluent in uh, uh, producing these things, certainly can understand them. Uh, but those are going to create very different intuitions about the way things are. It's not to say that people who are not able to produce uh, uh, visual languages uh, don't have worthy in intuitions and things that are interesting they can say about them that are worth uh, studying and bearing in mind. They, of course, can't do. Uh, but you have a different insight on them. Um, many of the primary things that I talk about um, are things about, say, the structure of the patterning, things like the grammar of sequential images. And it's very hard to, to know what a grammar is if you're not fluent in that language. So many people's arguments uh, in reply or, or other theories are all about the meaning of things. Here's how meaning is, is conveyed, meaning is derived, but it's without the insights of kind of the structural components that guide those meanings. And that's what I'm very much interested in is those structural components. If you just don't have the intuitions for how those things are built, you're not ever going to be able to manipulate that or think of how that structure will work because it's just not part of your your uh, your proficiency. So I would say, in fact, it's not just that you know I use my it's experience with drawing to rethink you know theories. I would say that my experience underlies virtually all of the theories that are built in the first place. Um, and most all of the, and not, I don't do this by purpose, but most all of the students who work with me as PhD students and things, things like that in my, my current team, everybody draws. Everybody has that sort of drawing experience and proficiency um, and those intuitions that they can draw from. Uh, I, I, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, putting 
myself behind the stage. Do you mean by that that I'm not uh, out drawing in the world so much? What's the uh, sense of that? Uh, I'm thinking in the sense that uh, for some research today, uh, having you one's positionality in the research play a large role in framing the research hmm. uh, does take a kind of, I would call it like more center stage in how they present their ideas and how they came to their conclusions. Yeah, I understand that. Um, so yeah, I, I do feel, so on the one hand, I guess I'm center staging my visual language capacities in that uh, regard, but at the same time, I'm a scientist and, um, you know, you know, I, I both recognize that in science, the scientist should not be, say, uh, you know, for a more objective view, the scientist is not putting themselves as the evidence, um, while at the same time, of course, one's experiences and uh, intuitions and background certainly inform the studies that you do, uh, but that's not evidence. And and I feel like you really need to have an evidence-driven support for things. You need to find, you know, literature that you know, provides empirical evidence of things. I can't just say stuff. I have to sh actually show through experimentation, through analysis of comics uh, in a corpus analysis, through data, you know, that is what really provides the substance for the uh, evidence of my claims, not just me saying it because I happen to be who I am. It's because I say it and then probably, seek evidence to support those claims. Um, and some of the evidence might come from, say, uh, intuitions. That is, I manipulate something and say, look, you can see how I violated this. And the fact that I violated it shows that I violated a rule. And you can see that rule, even if I don't provide you data with that, but you, your own intuitions uh, also can show you that that rule is there because it, you recognize when it's violated. Um, that's also a form of evidence, but it's 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 uh, not me just saying take take my word for it. Um, and I think that that's very important. Um, that said, uh, I am actively drawing things quite a bit. Most of my books have drawings as examples uh, from myself. Um, and I guess I can, uh, it's not a secret, but I, I am uh, and have been working on a graphic novel for many years about this research. Um, and that is aimed to be uh, out in about two years. So um, so that is a 300 page graphic book about the structure of uh, visual languages and comics and drawings and graphic uh, uh, expression. So, uh, you know, that's a little bit more on the stage, I guess, because uh, I am actively showing my own drawing ability to uh, demonstrate the things that I'm then talking about academically. Yeah, and I, I really look towards the field developing uh, more diversity and exploration into different qualitative methods, different quantitative methods. And uh, as a growing field, I'm excited. <laughs> so we'll see how everyone develops the different methodologies. Um, so if I can uh, bring you back to uh, some of these questions I have about specific uh, points in your research, uh, you state that in understanding visual narrative, semantic information aggregates in a growing situation model, which becomes updated when dimensions like characters or events change. And I was reading this and I was just thinking, uh, when people, when do people become aware that their semantic information has built up? Is it over a page, over a spread, over an issue? And do they then change their reading process? Uh, this is a little different maybe than for a book because of the page structure of comics. Yeah. Uh, so in the best case, people never realize it because they're so engrossed by the story that they don't recognize the cognitive processes that they're doing. Um, and even I, uh, for me, it's a even more balancing act because I know, I know what a lot of the structures are and I know what my brain is doing. So, you know, the best books for me are the ones where I stop analyzing as I'm reading. Um, Cause usually I can kind of do both and it doesn't detract from any sort of reading experience. I'm kind of both making observations about the structure at the same time as I'm reading and enjoying it, like uh, uh, without being a scientist. Um, 
And the times that it's most engrossing is when I just completely stop analyzing any of the structures at all because I'm just fully enveloped into the story. So I would say, you know, hopefully people are not aware of it. The times when you notice things more are usually when things go awry. So when um, there might be something that's overly challenging. Uh, so in, in this process, so a situation model, of course, is the um, kind of the mental understanding of a scene at, that it gets built up as you are comprehending a media. And, and the, the, the same theories persist basically for whether it's a reading of purely text or sequential images, images plus text, we're watching a movie, the same comprehension processes are, are posited. Um, so essentially what you do is you, as you read, you kind of take in information. You use that information to make predictions about what happens next. And those what predictions, I don't mean, here's what I think will happen. It's more like what your brain is just... Um, uh, uh, using the representations to think that something is happening. So one uh, uh, one type of prediction might be about events. If somebody reaches back their arm, you're gonna your brain, not even consciously, your brain will probably think that they're going to move their arm forward to punch or throw or something like that. Um, you might also have just a general expectation that in in a comic at least, if I have one panel, I might predict that the same characters are going to be in the next panel. Right, that's a, a an assumption that we acquire as part of the proficiency in understanding a sequence of images. That's not something that's conscious. This is just something that your brain builds up these sorts of patterns. Um, and that one, actually, we have a recent paper about um, uh, the. So, so as you as you read, your your brain makes these predictions, and then as you new information comes in, the degree to which uh, that incoming information conflicts with the way your brain predicted things to happen, you then have to update. And you have bigger updates when more things are uh, in Congress with the predictions that your brain makes about how things operate. So the bigger the changes, the, the bigger the update usually. And those changes might occur on lots of different levels. So it could be, uh, you know, you make these sorts of updates in, uh, for just navigating a page layout outside of the content. You make those sorts of updates for uh, the structure of the meaning. You also make those updates for the structure of the grammatical structure that I, I alluded to. Uh, so the bigger the change would be, the, the more hypothesized update would happen. Um, so a scene change, for example, is going to be more uh, incurring of cost because... Uh, you're suddenly cutting to a completely different location and, and um, possibly location, possibly characters, et cetera. Now, comics also structure this information in ways that um, sometimes recognize these changes in meaning are also packaged in changes in form. And that actually is hypothesized to alleviate some of the cost. For example, um, we did a we have a study where we have i have a corpus of 350 comics from europe america and asia where we have analyzed a variety of different structures that's one of the topics of uh, that is essentially what my next book is about um and a related study is about is in my current work which we can talk about later um and I had a student, uh, Ermak Hashimusa Olu, who is my uh, one of my PhD students. And she looked through this corpus and she found that, for example, scene changes correlate uh, very highly with um, uh, page turns, essentially. So very often when you uh, turn, when you shift to a new scene, it does so on a new page. And by having that segmentation, you're now uh, alleviating some of the cost of just a scene change because you're wrapping up with the segments of the, the pages themselves, the physical pages. What's also interesting though, is that this varies cross-culturally. So American and European comics do this quite a bit, but Asian comics don't. They do it at a much lower rate. So that means Asian comics are changing scenes within a page, um, much more often than American and European books. So one of the things we additionally hypothesized, this didn't make it into her paper, but it is in the book that I keep mentioning. Uh, one of the ideas was, well, maybe they use some other techniques 
to mark this. Uh, for example, wider gutters between panels. And it turns out if you look at that data, in fact, um, Japanese comics and Chinese comics, mostly, I think it's mostly Japanese comics, are indeed using w wider gutters as a marker to separate scene changes. So they are also doing structural components. It's just not at the page level, it's within a page, but they still have physical markers that indicate that there are changes between uh, scenes. So uh, these sorts of things are the updating thing, the, the, the greater updating processes. And the place where you become aware of it the most is also like where you don't understand something happens. Anytime, say, eye movements get scattered or look back uh, backwards, that's a sign of an updating process usually. So if you're like you're reading and then you're like, wait, I have to go back and did I get that right? And you look back again, that's a sign that you're doing one of these updating processes and they happen for a variety of reasons. That's a long winded answer, but anytime your eyes move back, that's a sign that you're, 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 if you become aware of that process. Okay. No, that's very interesting. I'm thinking about the, the page turns now in horror comics and those definitely line up uh, at least um, for the, the surprise reveals. Um, so in your book, you cover a, a lot of different types of people and a lot of different situations that people might have when they're reading. And I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you feel like you want to say anything on this, but do you think the general rise of disordered focus and attention will have any influence on the popularity of comics as a popular medium or, for example, for pedagogy? Will there be any sort of uh, movement towards single panel cartoons or shorter web comic strips? Do you see any association there? Uh, it's a really good question. I don't know enough about uh, disordered attention and the rates at which people actually have disordered attention or not. You know, I think it's a uh, uh, a wide range. To some degree, you know, I want to say yes, but to other degree, I want to say not necessarily. So, uh, if you look, for example, at uh, trends in the way people are creating digital comics. It's not like long form comics are going away. They've just changed in their format. So for example, uh, webtoons are incredibly popular and those are long form comics. Oftentimes they just are formatted differently. They're not on pages. It's just kind of this constant streaming flow of, uh, you know, an ever flowing single, you know, column <laughs> essentially. And that's just a different presentation method of the same sorts of uh, long form structures that you can have. And those are wildly popular, you know, um, and I think it's partially, you know, if you think about attention, it, you know, on the one hand, you can say, well, if people might not have the attention span to sit down with a, a book and be reading a book um, where they are moving from panel to panel across a book and then page to page, but the they might be certainly willing to on a phone or a tablet to be flipping image by image by image uh between images and uh to, to one degree the the comprehension processes there are exactly the same other than just the layout structure has changed to be a single column versus you know a z path uh grid column a grid uh, organization uh but the, like the storytelling methods are largely the same as far as I can tell. So that part really hasn't changed that much. What the scrolling does though, is there's a level, a further level of engagement, not in the comprehension process, but merely just with the fact that they, you have to flick your fingers to move from panel to panel and that sort of motor engagement likely helps sustain attention because you are now doing physical actions to get between units and that's going to sponsor at least some degree of attention to bring you into the story um uh so I, i'm not necessarily sure that uh say uh re you know shorter attention spans means the death of of uh engagement with longer literature or something you know maybe i mean you do see you know, shorter form things like a comic strip or a single panel are more shareable online, for example. So that makes them easier to spread uh, and easier to be engaged with quickly. But I don't think long form stuff is going to go away, but it might 
evolve into a way that further sponsors this sort of you know attentional engagement uh, so you're it's less of a passive process and none of that is about the storytelling mechanism it's simply just about the navigation and the 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 uh attention that you spend to you know the physical engagement with the media that might be a bit different um yeah Okay, interesting. Food for thought. I'll have to <laughs> uh, think about this. Um, so in your studies that you present in the book, a wide range of different studies, you come with all sorts of different conclusions, data. Um, I wanted to ask you, you're measuring factors such as ERP effects, viewing times, eye movements, uh, different metrics. What other forms of measurement have you not been able to use yet, but you would be interested in investigating? So the way I typically go about studies is I'm not a methodological um, determinist, one might say. So like, I don't, I don't, there's, there's some people who are like really big brainwave people and they, they, uh, that's ERPs. And so they, they are, you know, EEG, ERP people, and that's what they do. And that's what they primarily study. And they're into the very, into the methods of it. And they're into the, the study of that, what that tells you. And that's what they're into. And that's wonderful. Many of those people are very good friends of mine and colleagues and mentors of mine, et cetera. Uh, I have been much more about the philosophy that the method you use simply is chosen because of uh, what you want to study. So different methods tell you different things. And so you use the methods that are most optimal to what you want to find out. Um, most of my methods though, thus far have been reaction times, response times, viewing times, which are, uh, again, low cost in a sense, because it's easy to gather that data. Um, and it's fairly informative, uh, given, especially given there's a really big built up literature about it that you can then compare it to, uh, and brain responses, because a lot of my interest is in how do people's brains comprehend these things? What happens in the brain? Are those brain responses similar to the brain responses with, say, language and spoken languages, et cetera, which they are. Um, uh, so I've typically gone that direction. I myself am not trained in doing things like eye tracking, uh, despite many people thinking that I do a lot of eye tracking. I've only done a couple studies of eye tracking, um, and those have all been with colleagues. And um, I, I would love to do more eye tracking. That's something I think there's lots of things that we could be doing that I just haven't done yet. Um, it's just a matter of getting around to it. We have, like, so my... Uh, uh, department in my my research uh, uh, department in my university has like a whole bank of eye trackers. I think we have like six eye trackers. Like we have a whole bunch of them. I've never used them. We've also talked about combining eye tracking with the measure of brain waves. We've just never gotten around to it. Um, so you know, there. I'd love to do more eye tracking. Uh, there's also other methods, like you know, in the study of the brain. I'd love to engage with fMRI research. So brain waves give you really, they, they tell you about patterns of brain waves, tell you about different types of mechanisms of comprehension and what the brain is doing. They also are really good at telling you about the speed of processing. So how fast people process things, but they don't tell you much about where in the brain. fMRI, for example, that's the thing that typically gives you the pretty pictures of the brain um, of where in the brain. That tells you more about locations. There's also problems with fMRI in that it's actually not measuring the brain. It's measuring the blood flow around brain areas. So you're not actually picking up the actual brain areas. And um, in that regard, sometimes fMRI misses things, uh, misses parts of the brain that are engaged, which if you use different methods, you go, oh, that, that thing is involved in this. And then you do fMRI and go, well, now it's not coming up. And it's just a result of the way in which the, the measurement is. So um, I'd love to do more fMRI and combine it with other things. Um, uh, and uh, I'm really, uh, and of course, nowadays we have a growing number of things that you can do with um, computational techniques. Um, and we're starting to do some of that. But I think there's a lot of, you know, inroads to more and more complexity. But I, I really think it's best used as a tool and it should be thought about 
in the context of being a tool. Um, and we have like, again, we have like one study that's looking at using computational methods to analyze the structure of sequence of images that's currently in revision right now. Uh, but I'd love to do more of it. Uh, and, and a lot of it really requires just, you know, more complex infrastructure uh, than we currently have. And so it really requires a, little, a degree of sophistication about it. Um, uh, so in that regard, you know, I think there's lots to be uh, potential things to do, but um, it's, you know, complicated and you need, you need the resources to be able to do a lot of those things. And I'm not an expertise in them. So a lot of times what I do is uh, I, I know what my expertise is in and I, I, in all honesty, would like to be gravitating towards less active stuff where I am the one doing the analyses and the data gathering. I'd like other people to do that and I can simply inform and, and coach them and have, you know, like PhD students, et cetera, who they'll gather the data, they'll analyze it, do all that stuff. And I can say, oh, great job. This looks, this looks wonderful. Um, or other researchers. And, you know, that's part of, you know, the, of growing a, a, a field is lots of people doing common uh, techniques, uh, different techniques driving towards a, a broader goal. I would love for more and more people to be doing the sorts of things that I'm doing because then I don't have to be doing it all. Um, uh, but in that regard, you know, that's why I often take, have a lot, I have a lot of collaborations because I, especially you'll enjoy collaborating with people who have expertise in something that I don't have expertise in. So then they come to the table with what they do. That's really great. And then I say, here's what I have to contribute. And then we combine and do something that's even better. And that's what most of the eye tracking studies I've done and um, computational studies and other things that I'm just not an expert at. Other people are smarter than me at these things. So we might as well uh, join together and then, and then uh, uh, get something even bigger out of it. So the invitation or challenge is out there, and maybe the you'll invitation have some... <laughs> is always the invitation is always welcomed, and 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 the challenge of I definitely you know always want more people to be doing this, and uh, uh, and encourage more people to do it. I'm happy to advise or collaborate or whatever that people would be interested. In. Perfect. So it calls out. Um, so you've made a note in uh, one of your chapters that I found really interesting that there's just over a one year gap between the average age of reading comics and then making the jump to drawing or producing comics. And I just thought that was remarkably short. Um, does visual language fluency develop in any way like faster than the reading writing process or does it build on the progress made? Yeah. So um, the, the part that you're mentioning is based on surveys where we, so whenever people come to take our experiments, um, we have them take a, a questionnaire that asks about their comic reading habits and, uh, when they began reading comics and things like that. And we, uh, uh, we we've we've been using these all along to measure how proficiency interacts with uh, uh, comprehension, um, and in fact, typically we haven't used those things about when did you start reading and drawing comics, but in recent a recent study we did this where we combined data from twelve different uh, brainwave studies and showed that both proficiency. Uh, so how often people engage with visual narratives like comics and different types of comics, uh, that affects their brain responses in significant ways. But so does the age at which people start reading comics. And essentially, the earlier you start reading comics, the more your brain has a kind of fluent uh, uh, sorts of responses. Again, that's not to say that people who start reading comics later in life can't or understand it. Their brain does something bad or something. It's not the case. It's just, you, you show a different sort of uh, brain response. Um, so these are the self-reported measures. So I believe uh, you know, it's the, the average, something like people start reading comics around eight, start reading comic uh, drawing around nine or something like that. Um, but of course that's primarily like comics broadly construed. Um, before then, people are probably engaging with picture books. Um, you know, if it's if it's eight that people are reading comic uh, uh, books, you know, or that might be a lot of times there is a progression in the complexity of the literature that people engage with, right? Especially as children, we know that there's like young adult literature. There's also, you know, 
a progression with comics and sequential images. So people usually, kids usually start with certain types of comic strips, then progress to more complex comic strips and books, and then more complex books and, and graphic novels, et cetera, as, as they age. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I was in this, I'm getting sidetracked but i was in a discussion online at one point of people talking about like why do people does anybody like garfield it's so terrible um and um you know one i think garfield is actually pretty funny oftentimes but two my response to them was maybe it's not for you maybe garfield is really a perfect entrance for kids to be learning the structures of visual languages because it's it's visual structure is fairly simple um it has fairly straightforward jokes it has a solid repeated structure to the narrative oftentimes the the sundays are playing with a variety of different structures so um many children i think start out with comics like garfield because it scaffolds the more complex structures you know for you know dating myself it would be something like you go from garfield to calvin and hobbes to comic books to graphic novels and those are um you know there, there's a range of complexity within those structures so um it's not i think you know whatever people said in those surveys that we had that where you know age eight is where they start reading comics that doesn't mean that it's like well this is where they really begin they probably were reading picture books as kids they're probably reading you know even more simple things when they're infants um and i can say as a uh fairly new father um you know my kid is already looking at picture books he's eight months old he was looking at picture books when he was you know a month old um you know people start really early which is one of the reasons why we forget that there's proficiency associated with it because you're so used to being proficient that you can't imagine what it would like be like to not be proficient so you take it for granted um but if you look at like the picture books you have for infants and little kids they're largely lists so it's like this is a hamburger this is a pickle these are you know the, uh, you know you have a book of just different food items and then and that are drawings or here's a, one that has an animal on each page um that's just a list that's it is still sequential images but it's a list but that's what they can understand early on because they're still scaffolding the understanding of individual images at that point and later on they'll be able to get simple interact like events across panels but then even that you know, requires some proficiency um, and, you know, you build up structure by structure. So the proficiency in understanding a sequence of images, um, you know, largely progresses from about, you know, age zero through six or so. And by six-ish, you're probably getting a sequence of images. So it makes sense if you look at like generally as a general timeline, okay, you understand individual images around two to three, images of what images are and their uh, the events that they're doing and the actions that are taking place about two to three you start recognizing um kids start recognizing sequential images as a sequence between about four to six and if you think you're getting your kids are starting to get a sequence between four and six then starting to read actual comics by you know seven eight you know six seven eight something like that that kind of lines up and then if you're then comprehending these things, you know, then you're, you're going to be drawing them, you know, that's on a, the, 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 the age nine is like an average, but certainly kids are drawing long before that. So if they are drawing, they're probably also drawing, you know, especially if they're reading comics and exposed to comics, the, the greater the exposure, the earlier it is. Um, I myself, I, I've shown it several of my books. I have these drawings from Japanese kids. Uh, they're uh, comic strips that Japanese kids gave me when I lived in Japan because uh, they knew I liked comics. And so they gave them to me. And now they didn't know that I was going to then reprint them in books for years later. Um, but those were produced by, I believe, a Japanese seven-year-old, if I recall. And they're fairly proficient comics. They're, they look there's a lot of very consistent complex structures that are involved in this four panel strip, even though it's done by a seven-year-old. And so that's, you know, earlier than that average age quotes. And um, I, I would believe that Japanese kids who are 
exposed to a huge amount of manga while growing up and then imitative of it, all of those, you know, ages are probably shifted up. Um, but we don't have good data on it because nobody studied this in any sort of systematic way. Uh, so, you know, eight or nine for when people are drawing comics, maybe, but that also might be culture dependent uh, and it, we could probably do some more nuanced, uh, surveys and studies, um, you know, a lot of those surveys are also including people who are, you know, not super serious comic readers. It's a pretty wide range of people taking my studies. So, uh, you know, it's going to vary across uh, populations. So I think that there's a lot of um, potential for uh, a further follow up to that, but it would make sense. So your original question was, is that fast? And I would say uh, yes and no, because they've been building up that proficiency for a longer time. Uh but is it faster than literacy? Absolutely. Because, um, again, you know, this exposure, this proficiency comes from exposure and then practice, i.e. people just drawing largely self-motivated, as opposed to literacy, which is kind of culturally imposed, well, primarily through an educational system um, and or and or through parents who are then preceding the educational system. Um, so, um yeah, and literacy is, is a different thing. Uh, literacy is not a natural uh, uh, skill set. So the ability to draw and understand images is just part of something that we we do because we're humans. It's part of a it's a natural process. But literacy is the conversion of uh, graphics to convey sounds or to link sounds to them. You're literally drawing sounds, and so. In the, it, that's a different thing. And that's essentially hacking your brain's existing structures to get something different that the brain doesn't naturally do. It's incredibly useful, but it's not natural. And so that's why it requires most of the educational system is built around progressively improving your ability to do this mapping. Um, and so that's an incredible amount of um, sustained challenge to get your brain to do this as opposed to images. If you're exposed to them, you just happen to get your, just do it. Uh, and of course, to produce them, you're going to need some sustained action and, and effort that our culture doesn't necessarily have built into the common practices, right? So that's why it seems very difficult, but it's just part of the, the nature of uh, many cultures, uh, uh, things. Again, compared to Japan, where kids are constantly imitating manga, when they draw and and drawing as part of the cultural uh, 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 practice, particularly imitative of manga, and then you have much much higher rates of proficient drawers, um, all largely sharing a common visual language, mostly. <laughs> mostly. <laughs> mostly. Good, good. You can't you can't you know overgeneralize to everything. That's one of the also the themes of that book is people are different and there's a variety of ways that people come to bear on comprehension. And if you have universalist theories that everybody does things the same way, that is also not, you know, or here is the way that comics communicate. Well, for who, right? So does that vary? It does your theory account for the fact that different people comprehend things in different ways? If not, maybe it is, you know, uh, not, completely accurately characterizing the comprehension processes, which do vary across people. And you also investigated filmic narratives. So how does that make a different line of inquiry from looking at comics? Yeah, so my study of film, I should say I'm not actively doing research on film, but I can look at the literature and, and um, my study of film largely was comparative to static visual narratives like comics. Um, there's a couple themes to that. So one, I do teach a course on uh, the structure of, uh, of cognition of visual narratives. Uh, actually, my students are handing in their exams tomorrow um, and, uh, and their projects. And one of the things about the projects is that uh, they have to take my structural theory of, of that applies to uh, comics and apply it to different things. So they have to apply it to films and movie trailers and advertisements and 
uh, magic tricks, wrestling matches, all sorts of different things. The theory works well to account for the structures of most of these things. Um, and uh, it works perfectly fine to characterize, you know, films. So I wanted to, the chapter on film is partially talking about that, partially talking about, um, you know, what are the differences then in filmic comprehension processes compared to static sequential images? And there's a couple primary things that change, right? One is films, at least aside from animation, films are natural percepts. They're not drawings. Um, the things you look at captured by a camera or made to look like natural percepts through computer generated things at this point, but are essentially looking like natural percepts. Um, that's different. So you don't need to decode the nature of the graphics themselves. Uh, the, so, you know, the other main thing is, the, you know, movies move and um, the motion is going to wash over various structures that might otherwise be static that would require you to make a connection across static images that requires more proficiency than things moving that you are able to take in. So those sorts of differences lead to slightly different um, nature of what, what when people can't understand a sequence of images, a lot of those things are uh, irrelevant for movies because the basic things where people can't understand a sequence, movies just don't have. Uh, but the more complex things like complex methods of, let's call it storytelling, those things seem to have proficiency similarities uh, between film and static sequential images like comics. The other thing that I have to point out every single time I talk about this, uh, because people just don't seem to remember this fact, is that many films particularly films in uh, you know Hollywood, uh, United States, uh, filmic industries, um, and elsewhere, many, many of those films all begin as static drawings in storyboards. And storyboards are often produced by people who are currently or were previously comic artists. Um, in fact, friends of mine from the American comic industry have done storyboards for many very well-known popular movies. Um, they were comic artists first. So, and, and the conventions that they bring to bear on the storytelling uh, in storyboards are the same as they are in sequencing of images of comics. It's just storyboards have certain um, characteristic uh, uh, conventions of their own. They don't have a particularly interesting layout because they're not going to be read as a comic per se. Um, but the, 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 the basic structuring of the narrative visually first occurs in storyboards. And then that is kind of painted over, let's say by moving images after they're filmed and then maybe altered somewhat by the editing process, but they start off as drawn drawings right and uh people don't seem to acknowledge this very often um in both uh filmic theories about how films are understood uh and structured uh there is no academy award for storyboarding um so it's you know there there's it's like this invisible uh contribution to the nature of filmic storytelling that is actually starting as static. And that is actually true if you think about many things in society begin as drawings that don't end up looking as drawings afterwards. Virtually all technology is first dr drawn before they build it. Any en engineering drawings, uh, any, uh, you know, my furniture, your, your tables, clothing, fashion, uh, uh, buildings, you know, um, uh, uh, landscaping, all these things were drawings before they were enacted to be what they ended up as in society. It's just that those drawings are then invisible to us after you see the finished product. Um, and so, you know, drawing and graphic production is actually far more pervasive and influential than people give it credit for when they talk about, say, visual culture. All these things are drawings first, you, know, you can't do these things with just text describing what uh, engineering should be. You have to do a 
you a, a graphic version of it first. So like the storyboards, you know, there's this invisible, you know, graphic production that underlies most of society or much of society um, that is just simply not acknowledged um, because it's not what you end up seeing in the aftermath key point and uh yeah uh that i feel like that's another thing that could be an entirely different conversation very very interesting um so neil you've you've given a few indications that you're working on some stuff now uh some hinted uh at uh what that might be could you give us a sneak peek what projects you're working on now or anything you're looking forward to yeah i will i have a lot that i'm looking forward to um as usual so i i'm uh, I'm a little hyperactive, so I always have about a million things happening at once. Uh, I'll start by the fact that I have a book coming out every year for the next three years. Uh, so I have a book coming out uh, in next in November slash December of this year. That book is called The Patterns of Comics, and it's an analysis of 350 plus uh, comics from Europe, America, and uh, Asia. And what I we have. Uh, gone through these comics panel by panel and analyzed i think it's something like thirty-six thousand panels in all of these for a variety of different structural properties and then this book is just like a deep dive into this data so in who understands comics there's one chapter that goes into some of the data from that same data set uh, but this book now is a full book length probing of this data uh, to explore what are the systematic tendencies? Are there cross-cultural variabilities? Do we have evidence that there are different visual languages that might transcend different cultural uh, boundaries? For example, you know, people speak languages that are not necessarily bound to individual countries. Uh, people speak English, for example, all over the world, not just in England or America. Um, English is not bound to a particular cultural context. And many languages are like that. They Languages are not bound specifically to different cultures, even though they might originate in, as having a cultural origin that they're commonly associated with. Um, visual languages are posited to be the same. So you can have a visual language that transcends its specific cultural origins. For example, the Japanese visual language used in manga is not bound to Japan. It's used all over the place in quote unquote manga around the world. So um, we investigate that. We have some uh, uh, essentially, you know, chapter by chapter breakdown of numerous different structures and what the data tells us about this, uh, both uh, cross culturally, uh, over time, how th structures have changed over time. Um, and there is one chapter that is uh, just a dedicated analysis to uh, every Calvin and Hobbes strip. Uh, that was ever done, um, where we analyze all the structures of Calvin and Hobbes and show how it has changed over time. Um, so that's the patterns of comics that comes out in November, December, depending on where you are, I guess. Um, in June of 2024, I have a book coming out called A Multimodal Language Faculty, which is a very linguistic ebook. Um, there are discussions of things like comics and memes and emoji and whatnot throughout it. Uh, but really it's, it's a kind of grand unified theory of the structure of all of communication and lang and language and graphics and gestures and sign languages, et cetera. Um, and it's an attempt to um, propose a different paradigm of thinking about what language is and how it works really. Um, and I know that's kind of a bold statement, but I, I really think that's what we do. And we do so by also breaking down the history of the study of language and the assumptions that are made about it, um, and then showing where there's evidence that conflicts all of these basic assumptions, um, and that you need to have a new, a new assumptions, a new paradigm of thinking about things, and that leads to a different model of what language is and how it works. Um, it's a multimodal model. So that's coming out in June. And then in 2025, I have uh, my graphic novel should be coming out either 2025 or early 2026. Uh, and that's a 300 page nonfiction graphic book uh, about the structure of visual languages and graphic communication um, and how visual languages work. And that's all visual language theory, but hopefully for a, 
broader audience uh, than my academic work. Um, hopefully the academics will also enjoy it, but it's it's meant for a, a wider audience. And it's both teaching what are what are the structures going on in pictures and graphics? What's you know, what's the structure of language? Why are they the, the similar to each other? What does the research tell us about this? Um, and uh, I'm I'm quite excited about it. I have this is this is the whole thing right here. Uh, <laughs> for for listeners, uh, I have an exclusive visual <laughs> confirmation of uh, uh, some of the sketches. They're fabulous, yeah. fabulous. So this is three hundred pages of roughs. Um, I I do everything in full size roughs. Uh, first, I've probably redrawn this book about four times uh, at this point. I, I've I've had many 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 drafts over probably how many years now five years, six years already. And um, uh, my draft is now stable. And so then I'm going to do the finishes on it. So I'm going to start drawing uh, the finished work within the next couple months and uh, work on that for about a year plus, and then it'll be out in 2026. So those are the, the things that are coming out. Uh, I also should mention, um, if I have time, that we have a very large grant project that we've been working on for the last four years uh, that is funded by the European Union, uh, sorry, the European Research Council. Uh, and uh, it was a, what's called a starting grant to me, uh, where we have been uh, called the Tintin Project. And the Tintin Project is building another uh, corpus or database of analyzing comics. In this case, our corpus is 1,030 comics from 143 different countries. Um, it really is a global uh, uh, a global scope of comics uh, because in the patterns of comics, though it's very insightful and everybody should buy that book, um, it is limited in the number of places that are included. And so we really wanted to have a truly global analysis. And uh, we are analyzing all sorts of different, very interesting structures. And we're now at the stage where we're starting to be finishing some of the fields of analysis that we've been looking at. And uh, that means we're about to start our actual analysis of the data. So within the next few years, you'll probably be seeing some very kind of big data analyses of comics worldwide, starting with uh, just a paper that's going to be what what are the properties of panels? Not even like what's in them, just how many panels are there per page on average? What is the relative sizing of panels uh, on a page? Um, you know, things like that. And uh, those are really very basic things that people have never reported any sort of data about. Um, and we have more and more complex structures that we're looking at within this as well. So it's very exciting to be entering the stage where we're able to then do these large scale comparisons. And then we're also able to ask uh, things like, okay, let's say you have something that one of the things we've analyzed backgrounds. Do panels have backgrounds? What types of backgrounds do they use? There's no large data about this anywhere. There's hardly any theories about backgrounds. Um, so we've analyzed this in, you know, a thousand comics. So we'll be able to say, you know, okay, the, the varieties that occur in the ways backgrounds are used, is it due to cross-cultural variation? Is it due to, um, say, uh, visual language differences that's not cross-cultural? Like, the American visual language used in superhero comics versus Japanese mangas, Japanese visual language, um, you know, and those persist across the world, not bound to specific cultures. Is is that motivating the variation that you see in background use? Um, has it changed over time? Is it related to the languages that people speak, how they use backgrounds? So all of these dimensions are things that we're going to look at for every single you know, uh, uh, domain that we investigate. And that ends up being, you know, very interesting way of probing the structures that are involved in, in comics uh, worldwide. So that's um, the most exciting thing that we're working on right now. And we're, we're very soon going to be doing quite a lot of that. That's a very exciting uh, culmination of your long 
research project. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah. So, so much to look forward uh, coming out from you and your, your lab and your work. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll all be waiting for those books. And uh, Neil, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to chat with you and to hear about your research and your ideas, get those insights and uh, the sneak peek of your comic. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, thanks very much for having me. And uh, yeah, I hope it was interesting or at least entertaining for people. Absolutely. Thank you.